Ethereum was built to be a sort of new and improved version of Bitcoin and to do things that Bitcoin couldn't do. The original aim with Ethereum was to create not just a decentralized money, but essentially a decentralized global computer that could do computational problems. Ethereum has its own currency, Ether. The Ether, though, are really there to serve as sort of gas for the computations that are going on on this network of computers that are running Ethereum. The original reason why it likes the name is that Ether is this uh, sort of thing that, you know, scientists were hypothesizing about in the 19th century where people were thinking sound waves travel through air, uh, water waves travel through water, so what, what do light waves travel through? And they hypothesized this existence of a medium that kind of permeates the entire universe that's uh, in that itself is kind of invisible, but it provides this kind of global reference frame and it is in some sense, you know, the sort of base layer that the universe runs on. And I actually felt that was a kind of fitting analogy for what I wanted to do. Идея теперь такой, какой-то неправильный подход в этом говорить. Я бы сказал, что Ethereum есть фичи и возможности делать такие вещи, которые у биткоина нет. То есть это так же, как сказать, что там может ли там телефон победить апельсин. So Ethereum is a decentralized application platform. Um, it's parent. Um, Bitcoin is uh, more of a platform for transmission and storage of value. So Bitcoin was essentially a, an experiment in monetary theory gone wildly successful. You can think of Ethereum as a decentralized World Wide Web. It will eventually be able to run all the different kinds of applications uh, that we see on the World Wide Web. At the end of the day, it's this kind of fabric for what, some, what you could almost describe as being a kind of new internet infrastructure. Eventually run a Facebook-like application. Uh, the difference is that it would be peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized, rather than a client-server type architecture. Ownership of data, ownership of communications or informational emissions will rest with the users of the system rather than the owners of a company like Facebook. I think Vitalik knows what that he's building a giant globally distributed reprogrammable supercomputer on a scale that mankind has never seen before and he's doing it through a mechanism which initially supports this concept of smart contracts and issues a token just like bitcoin so there's value being created by the mining that we're doing but the biggest difference is that ethereum produces mines that are reprogrammable to tasks that we don't necessarily know what they're gonna, that they're gonna do yet. One of the highest ambitions of Ethereum from the beginning was that you would actually be able to program the functioning of entire corporations into this global computer. And you would have not just a decentralized currency, but a decentralized company that would run according to the rules that you had programmed into this network. So the, there, was always, there was always this idea that Ethereum might allow what people call decentralized autonomous organizations. De so decentralized autonomous organizations, they're this idea that you can have these kind of automatons that are written in code that's set on the blockchain and that are governed through you know, smart contracts. It could be like some voting mechanism. It could be even be some kind of voting by prediction markets or you know, some other new thing. Would be a sort of company that would be run not according to human decision making or, or human rules, but instead according to rules that you programmed into 
the Ethereum network. Can actually leave um, the sort of decision making up to an artificial intelligence. So if you had a board, you could basically say, hey, we can't come to a consensus. Um, let's just refer this to an AI. And everyone just delegates their vote to the, to the robot. And then the robot just makes the decision for them. And then eventually you could imagine that many boards are just run by AI and occasionally intervene by humans. DAO attracted something like $150 million in the course of a little over a month. Basically, you know, on the first days that it was operational, you had this attacker who came in and managed to take advantage of the contracts in a way that basically siphoned about half of the money into uh, an account under the control of the attacker. The one saving grace in this attack was that the money that was siphoned off because of the way the DAO was uh, written couldn't be used for 30 days. And so it began this countdown to try to figure out how to stop the attacker from getting control of the $60 million. And so we have this time in order to see, to determine whether we're going to do something about it or whether we're just going to let it go. I don't think that Ethereum has the balls to uh, leave the theft as is. They're talking about hard forking the uh, entire blockchain. It set off this really pretty philosophical debate about how to deal with a problem like this in the realm of smart contracts and virtual currencies. And one of the great attractions of, of the blockchain technology and of Bitcoin and Ethereum was that this record of transactions going back in time could never be changed. That's one of the reasons this was so valuable. You could look back and know that a transaction happened and know that nobody could tamper with that, nobody could change it. Once you had the DAO, people wanted to go back and change these contracts so that this person who seized all of this money, that those transactions wouldn't be valid. But that, that struck at the very core of what Ethereum was supposed to be. 